Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Hey, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard. My name is Adam, and I welcome you. Uh, this is week two of our Torah portion study, which is going to cover Genesis 6-9 through the end of chapter 11. Lots to discuss, as always. We've got Noah, the flood. We've got the, the whole wickedness of the earth. And keep in mind, remember, this Torah portion is extremely important because Messiah said that as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So... If we want to be aware of what it's going to be like when Messiah comes back, we should probably pay attention to this Torah portion. And just in case uh, this may be new to you, what we've done is there's a group of people that have been called out of man-made religion and are recognizing that we're to come back to the ancient path, the, the old way of doing things, uh, the way that our Heavenly Father has ordained us to walk. What's, what's good in His eyes? What's evil? Because we recognize that a lot of us has been inundated with man-made traditions. Some of you grew up in Christianity. I grew up in Judaism. N not any better. Uh, tons of man-made traditions, and the call is to come out. It doesn't matter if you grew up in atheism. Obviously, all that is man-made doctrine. Um, Buddhism, whatever it is, the call is to come out, come out of her, if you will, false religion, and come back to his way. And so... A lot of us are recognizing that we need to do that. So this is a big part of actually doing it, reading the Torah, which is the foundation of every all the scriptures. This is where we learn uh, the basis of what the prophets were even preaching. What, what, what were they even saying? Why were they saying come back to the law? What, why were they saying come back to the commandments? What are even the commandments? Uh, and, and of course, really, uh, especially these first a couple of uh, Torah portions is really just learning true history. True history is Torah, as we spoke about last week, standing up for the creation story. Our Heavenly Father said, this is how things, this is how it went. Compare that, of course, with what the world teaches, and this is why a lot of people no longer trust what science and the, the schools are teaching us anymore. Nevertheless, let's get back to the point. We're here to study the Torah, and I'm glad that you're here with us. Let's start off with a little uh, prayer. Ask our Heavenly Father to bless our study together, and we'll we'll move forward. So, Heavenly Father, Most High, we just come and present ourselves before you as your assembly, your people, uh, who believe in you, believe in your Son, Messiah, Yahusha, who came and died for us, the Word made flesh, our King, our High Priest. Father, we just ask that you bless us with your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, to help us understand these words and to apply them to our lives and to um, just be ready. Be ready at the return of Messiah. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for this rest, and we bless you and thank you in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, so let's uh, let's do a quick shofar. I, once again, I'm unprepared with my shofar, so we're going to have to do a road shofar. Um, so if you have your shofars at home, get them ready, and let's blow them. Okay, so before we get actually get into the Torah portion, just a few quick passages. Again, reminding us what we're doing here. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law or the Torah of Yahuwah is perfect, converting the soul. It literally converts us. Uh, the testimony of Yahuwah is sure, making wise the simple. Uh, and this is why he says he confounds the wise. Um, the, the wisdom of this world is foolishness of his eyes. Learning the Torah is true wisdom, and I'm excited to do that with you all. Psalm 119.1, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law, the Torah of Yahuwah. And uh, one last one, of course, Psalm 1, 1 through 3, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in what? In the Torah of Yahuwah, and in his Torah does he meditate day and night. 
So the person that does this will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. So you want to prosper in your life? Well, adhere to the law, the Torah of the Most High. It doesn't mean your, your life's going to be easy, everything's going to be perfect, but if you want to prosper and if you want to bear fruit, the fruit that he wants, well, here we are. Let's get into it. So with that being said, um, what we're going to do is, some of you may know Jake and I, um, we uh, we did a uh, an audio book series, and it's dramatized. So what we've been doing is we're going to read the whole chapter, and then we're going to study, uh, and we're going to we're going to go over different uh, talking points. Uh, and uh, again, these studies here are positioned just as that as studies, like as if you were hanging out with me in my living room, and we're reading it, and I'm just kind of sharing my study notes uh, over the years. Um, so I look at this as studying together. So with that being said, we're going to play the uh, the Torah portion. Uh, we're going to play it for chapter 6, and then we will talk about it. So here we go. Here's chapter 6. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with Elohim. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Chem, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And Elohim said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make you an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall you make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which you shall make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shall you make to the ark, and in a cubit shall you finish it above. And the door of the ark shall you set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shall you make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with you will I establish my covenant, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, and your woman and your sons' women with you, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shall you bring into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto you to keep them alive. And take unto you of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to you, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that Elohim commanded him, so did he. Okay, so, um, praise, yeah, so Genesis 6, let's talk about it. Um, a couple things that, a couple things, actually something that's really nice too is when we were doing this, actually something came to mind, I was like, I was going to take, take a quick note as I heard the reading. Um, for me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a much better uh, learner by listening than by reading with my own eyes, so a lot of times when I study, uh, some of you ask how I study, a lot of times when I study, I'll actually study by listening to the word, I'll actually read it and listen it, listen to it, and so it's like a double impact for me, at least for me. Um, any case, so it was something I was just thinking about, you know, it's just like everything died, like he killed, like he killed everyone, and it's his right, you know, it, people like Richard Dawkins and others, uh, they they make fun of you, and I it, it makes me mad, but um, they'll they'll say things like uh, he he you know he's he's just 
a big old meanie. He kill he kills everyone, but such and such. And to recognize that this is this is his earth and it's his right. If he says that this is the way we should be living, well this is the way we should be living. I'm sorry again for the flashy screen thing. I, I don't know. I've I've tried quite a few things to fix it and it's still not working. Um nevertheless, uh sorry for the distraction distraction on that. But think about this. You don't think that there is maybe some nice people um they were probably you know some maybe they were wicked but we don't think they were like just nice like oh he's so nice though i don't understand how how yah could kill wickedness is wickedness right it doesn't matter um people's temperament if someone is just wicked that's i mean yah has determined that that's what's going to happen uh going back to um you know, going back to Psalm three, um, we 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 learned about what happens to the righteous, uh, but the wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked shall not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the sinners shall perish. They will die, whether it's you know uh, being burned up at his coming or dying the second death. They they just don't have life in them. And my point is. The reason I'm bringing this up is because people are like, well, I just don't understand. You know, uh, my, my, my grandma, my great grandma was so nice and was so this and the. This is why it's so important uh, and, and it's not a it's not a light matter uh, to share the gospel, to to show people the truth, because life and death is at stake. He's not a liar. We saw that he's done it before. He says, now, as we'll learn, he'll say he'll, he'll say later that he'll never destroy the earth with a flood again. But we know that he's going to destroy quite a few people with famine, with with war, uh, with fire. And, man, this is why I just believe that just, there's just such an urgency. I do believe we are living in the days of Noah. It says, it says that uh, everything was corrupt. Um, everything. The whole, the whole earth was filled with violence. Uh, the earth was corrupt for him, filled with violence. Looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. But just like we saw, uh, and we'll see in next week's horror portion, or was it the week after, when, uh, when, when Abraham prayed for Sodom, Yah said that, you know, all the, way, all the way to ten people, he's like, if I find ten righteous people, I'll save the whole city. And of course, we know how that worked out. He didn't find 10 people and only Lot and his family was, was saved. And even those that were saved that didn't obey the instructions didn't make it. My point behind my point is this is not a game. This is literally life and death. And so we should treat it as such. And we should treat these stories. We should we'd be blessed to be like we live in a time where we can read all these stories and learn from all them. Man, this... Uh, this camera thing. I, I don't know what to do. I'm so sorry. I've tried almost everything. Uh, I can just maybe just turn me off. That would be maybe a little less distracting. So there I am. I'm gone. Um, so with that being said, let's uh, let's do, let's go over a couple different things on this chapter. So in verse 8 it says, or I just want to read this. In verse 8 it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. Of course, that was last week's Torah portion. Um, I, something I didn't cover last week, but I want to cover this week, is the same Yah that saw the whole earth was was trashed, basically. He still, he, his eyes were on Noah. And I want to go over some scriptures real quick. Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Proverbs 5, 21 says, For the ways of man are before the eyes of Yahuwah, and he ponders all his going. So remember, Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahuwah. So I'm asking, has Yahuwah changed? Do his eyes go to and fro the earth and, and search everything out? Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of Yahuwah are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of Yahuwah are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of Yahuwah is against them that do evil. The flood is the perfect story for what Peter just said here. 
Yah had his eyes on Noah and his family. They're righteous. He protected them. Everyone else, unrighteous. And we'll find out through the book of Jasher very shortly that Messiah, uh, Messiah, that Noah preached, uh, preached to the, the children of men for 120 years. Not one of them listened. Second Chronicles 16.9, For the eyes of Yahweh were run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in, behalf, in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards them, towards him. Job 34, 21 through 22, for his eyes are upon the ways of man and sees all his goings. There is no darkness nor shadow where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of Yahuwah are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. I think I'm pretty sure this is what Peter was pulling from. Deuteronomy 13, 18, when you shall hearken to the voice of Yahweh Elohim to keep all his commandments, which I command you this day, to do that which is right in the eyes of Yahweh. And that's what we're doing here. Of course, we're learning the Torah uh, to do what's right and righteous in his eyes. And of course, Deuteronomy 6.25 says, And it shall be our righteousness righteousness, if we observe to do all these commandments before Yahweh Elohim as he commanded us. No, we know that we are made clean and made righteous by Messiah. But after that act has, has been performed for us by our high priest, our walk still determines our fate. Just like, remember, the Israelites left Egypt and they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. Of course, a foreshadow of the true Lamb. They went into Egypt, things got hard, they were tested, and most of them didn't make it. Only the obedient did. So, just an exhortation, brothers and sisters, and a, and a comfort and a reminder of what we're doing here, to do what's right in the eyes of Yahuwah, because the eyes of Yahuwah, uh, of course, are uh, all over the face of the earth here. Um... So verse 9 says that Noah walked with Elohim. Let's let's go through some scriptures to see what it really means to walk with Elohim. Genesis 5, 21 through 24 last week says Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with Elohim after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with Elohim and he was not for Elohim took him. So Micah 6, 6 through 8, let's define walking with Elohim. Wherewith or what shall I come before Yahuwah and bow myself before the high Elohim? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will Yahuwah be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does Yahuwah require of you? but to do justly. It's like to do what's right and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your Elohim. Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 16. And now Israel, what does Yahweh your Elohim require of you, but to fear Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in all his ways, which means, of course, to walk in his Torah and to love him and to serve Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of Yahweh and his statutes, which I command you this day for your good. Behold, the heaven of heaven, the heaven, I'm sorry, and the heaven of heavens is Yahweh, is Yahuwah's your Elohim. The earth also with all that it therein is. Only Yahuwah had a delight in your fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. First Timothy 5 says, Now the end, or the goal of the commandment is love, out of a pure heart and a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So it's like the whole reason of the Torah is love, is to show love to Yah and to love people. And in the Torah just tells us how to do it. So praise Yah. Uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 23. This is more about walking with Yahuwah. This that I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law or not under the condemnation or, or of the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. 
But the fruit of the Spirit, so walk in the Spirit, right, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So this is that Spirit and truth. The Spirit, of course, are, are these qualifier, are these qualities of what it looks like, your behavior. Um, and if, Or not like your behavior, of course, is adherence to the Torah. But this is like um, who you are. Do you, are you a person that has love and joy and peace and all these these qualities? So both equally as important, and I believe this is a pretty decent definition of what it means to walk with Elohim. Uh, let's uh, let's take a look here. Uh, let's see right here. Let's see if I can give me just a moment. Let's see if I can turn this back on. Uh, are you going to behave? Maybe. Nope. Okay. No, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, chapter 6, verse 12. It says, And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth as you remember last week we learned in enoch 6 7 and 8 that the angels they came down they mated with women they created these giants these giants kept breeding uh they sinned against birds and beasts and reptiles creating these dinosaurs and all these different things that were just destroying his creation his creation wasn't made for giants and for for dinosaurs and things like that that these massive creatures just that just ate everything uh, one of the big reasons why so i think a lot of the people's uh, and think about this uh, how many, how many giants were there? Because let's just be real for a second. Let's put ourselves in that time frame. So you have these angels that come down. They mate with uh, women. They create these giants. Everyone knows what happened. This is not some secret. Um, it doesn't take long. We we know in the Torah community, it doesn't take long for everyone to find out when something goes on. Like, hey, did you hear about? Blah, blah, blah. So how much more back then? Like, hey, wh where did these massive creatures come from? You don't think that they wanted to interbreed? Like interbreed and like make more like hey i want to be like that. i want to have children like this and so uh it would be very quickly where all flesh would be have corrupted its way just like uh in a similar way now if we can uh parallel to what's going on now we have things like uh gene editing crispr uh, all these different technologies uh they've got um, they're putting pig hearts in humans uh for transplants um they're mixing pig and and mice uh dna to make these enviro pigs um they're they're uh, they're doing all sorts of things. Uh, from what I understand, they've been doing this stuff uh, for many decades uh, in this, in, at least in this country. Um, all right, let's see. I want to share Isaiah 66, 17. Speaking of the Enviro pig, if you haven't heard of uh, the Enviro pig, let's see. So this is, I, this is an article about animal human hybrids it's actually from bbc so this is a mainstream article um i'm not going to read it for you but if you want to do your own research it's very interesting of how much inter animal human hybrid inter uh interwoven beings the uh, uh, that, that they're very forward about and how uh, they encourage that today and, and it's quite interesting but uh, also it look at research something called the enviro pig and you'll find that that's really interesting and it relates to isaiah 66 17 it says they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in gardens behind one tree in the midst eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together says yahuwah <clears throat> so when he comes back he's going to destroy people that eat pig and mice and all these other abominations but i think it's interesting that, that we have a pig today that is a mix of swine which is pig and a mouse it's called the enviro pig check it out it's pretty prophetic uh in in that way so you know are we at a time uh and not and it says all flesh corrupted its way so in, in my thought they're they're corrupting the dna they're mixing things that aren't supposed to mix they're they're finding ways to to make animals interbreed with each other that shouldn't or, or uh, humans and animals and um you know, there's lots of uh, stories about these uh, chimeras throughout the centuries. Even the book of Jasher uh, has uh, uh, some details about some uh, human-animal hybrids that may have been somehow left over from, from the flood. Or maybe uh, they were able to figure out in the time of um, um, Nimrod, which we'll read about him in a little bit. Uh, they were into all sorts of wickedness. It's perhaps they were able to find out how to do that as well, how to do those things. But not only just the DNA end, but think about it. Um, 
uh, even in today, like think of modern society with uh, how they're corrupting flesh through the LGBT, you know, movement. Um, this is a corruption of flesh. This is a, a confusion, uh, as the scripture calls it. And he calls it an abomination when a man is with a man or a woman's with a woman or you have, you know, multiple things going on. Uh, and uh, men, uh, uh, people with 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 animals. These are confusion. And of course, the transgender stuff. Um even even smaller things, it, it, of course, transgender is, is, is corrupting the flesh. They're, they're they're changing the natural order of things. Uh, if you even look at like augmentation, like uh, uh, you know Botox, and you know I'm not judging anyone out there that has that, but you know as a people of Yah, should we be augmenting our body? You know, is this that's not how Yah made you? Um, we shouldn't be so vain that we feel like we have to keep this up uh, this appearance for for one another. Uh, we should recognize that. Well, hey, you know, Yah made us this way. Like, I I have a big nose. Like, so what? Yah made me this way. You know, if, if people don't like my nose, then okay. Which people have mentioned on YouTube, like, hey, your nose is too big. Like, okay, praise Yah. This is how he made me. Take it up with him. I didn't make this nose, right? Um, but is that is that a corruption of flesh? And again, some of you may have some augmentation from uh, your your previous life. Maybe you, you still think it's okay. I, I'm, I'm not challenging you, but I'm just asking because it, it doesn't say thou shalt not uh, augment uh, your your lips. It doesn't say that. you know. So I can't add to the Torah, but I just wonder if that's something that's against his nature of things, his creation. Uh, and of course, uh, we talked about it a second ago, the CRISPR technology, the gene editing, making designer babies. Um, you have this like, uh, well, I guess like adrenochrome wouldn't be necessarily, it's, just, it's something that's sick that's going on in this world. But are we living in a time where I wouldn't say all flesh had corrupted its way, um, but a lot, you know, I would consider us to be in the time of... of um, the days of Noah. Let's read, uh, we're going to read Enoch 106. This is Enoch uh, 106. We're going to read verse 10 and through the end. This is about the, the birth of Noah. And it says, And now my father hear me. Unto Lamech, my son, there has been born a son, the like of whom there is none. And his nature is not like man's nature. And the color of his body is whiter than snow and redder than the bloom of a rose. And the hair of his head is whiter than wool. And his eyes are like the rays of the sun. And he opened his eyes and thereupon lighted up the whole house. And he arose in the hands of the midwife and opened his mouth and blessed Yahweh of heaven. And his father Lamech became afraid and fled to me and did not believe that he was sprung from him, but that he was in the likeness of the angels of heaven. And behold, I have come to thee that you may make known to me the truth. And I, Enoch, answered and said to him, Yahuwah will do a new thing on the earth. So he started fresh with Noah. Noah had um, fresh DNA. Um, uncorrupted because it's very it seems very um, evident that everyone had corrupted their all flesh had corrupted its way so like Yah did like a fresh restart he pushed like the restart on the human DNA with Noah so Yahweh will do a new thing in the earth and this I have already seen in a vision and make known to you that in the generation of my father Jared some of the angels of heaven transgressed the word of Yahuwah and behold, they commit sin and transgress the law and have united themselves with women and commit sin with them and have married some of them and have begotten children by them. And they shall produce on the earth giants, not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. Now, with that statement, I wonder, are there people walking today that are giants in the spirit? Do you want to be one of them? I want to be one of them, if that thing, if that even exists. And there shall be a, a great punishment on the earth, and the earth shall be cleansed from all impurity. Now, thinking of that, if we want to be those people, I think Messiah is the best representation. He was he was the most giant uh, in the Ruach here. And how was he? He was meek. He was humble. He was lowly. He he taught goodness. Uh, he died uh, he died uh, for righteousness' sake and for what's doing what's right. Yea, there shall come a great destruction over the whole earth, and there shall be a deluge and a great destruction for one year. And this son who has been born unto you shall be left on the earth, and his three children shall be saved with him, when all mankind that are on the earth shall die, and his sons shall be saved. And now make known to your son Lamech that he who has been born is in truth his son. 
and call his name Noah, for he shall be left to you, and he his sons shall be saved from the destruction which shall come upon the earth on account of all the sin and all the unrighteousness which shall be consummated on the earth in his days. And after that there shall be still more unrighteousness than that which was first consummated on the earth. For I know the mysteries of the holy ones, for he, Yahuwah, has shown me and informed me, and I have read them in the heavenly tablets. And of course, this is absolutely true. Things only got worse. Uh, not worse, but they got they, well, they got worse again, I guess. So, uh, again, as in the days of Noah, Luke 17, 26 through 32 says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what does that tell you? When the Son of Man is revealed, the righteous escape. These are the two witnesses we have. Noah escapes in his family. Lot escapes in his family when destruction comes. So when, when Yahusha comes back, the righteous are saved, the wicked are destroyed. That's how it goes. In that day... He which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down and take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife who turned back. Let's go to um, 614. It says, Make you an ark of gopher wood. Room shall you make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. This is a very interesting word that we would just really pass by. If we look at the word used here, the word is uh, kafar, which is exactly the same spelling as kippur. Uh, as we know, these little nikudim were not added uh, until much later. So literally, it's the same word as atonement. You know, like Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So literally, the ark was covered with atonement. Pretty cool. Think about the ark. It saved Noah and 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 rescued them. We know we know, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. We know Messiah. He literally is our ark. He covers us with atonement. Just some interesting little uh, foreshadows here. It's something, again, you just would just pass right by. But he says, uh, literally, he says, you shall cover it with atonement. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, at least in my opinion. And uh, so going with the end of chapter 6, um, you know, of making the ark and, and getting it prepared, uh, I want to read a little bit from the book of Jasher in case you're new. Uh, the book of Jasher. Uh, was the book of Joshua was um, mentioned in Joshua ten thirteen and Second Samuel one eighteen not one eighty nine. It says, um, is it not written in the book of Jasher in Joshua 10, 13? And once again, behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. Some people would say that this is not the real Jasher. Um, I disagree in love. I think this is the Jasher. The book of Jasher, which means the book of the upright. Jasher is not someone's name. So here we go. Jasher 5, we're going to read Jasher 5, 5 through 36. And all who followed Yahuwah died in those days before they saw the evil which Elohim declared to do upon the earth. And after the last lapse of many years, in the 480th year of the life of Noah, when all those men who followed Yahuwah had died away from amongst the sons of men, and only Methuselah was left. then left, Elohim said unto Noah and Methuselah, saying, Speak ye and proclaim to the sons of men, saying, Thus says Yahuwah, Return from your evil ways and forsake your works, and Yahuwah will repent of the evil that he has declared to do to you, so that it shall not come to pass. For thus says Yahuwah, Behold, I give you a period of 120 years. If you will turn to me and forsake your evil ways, then will I also turn away from the evil which I told you, and it shall not exist, says Yahuwah. And Noah and Methuselah spoke all the words of Yahuwah to the sons of men, day after day, constantly speaking to them. But the sons of men would not hearken to them, nor incline their ears to their words, and they were stiff-necked. And Yahweh granted them a period of 120 years, saying, If they will return, then will Elohim repent of the evil, so as not to destroy the earth. Noah, the son of Lamech, refrained from taking a wife in those days to beget children, for he said, Surely now Elohim will destroy the earth, wherefore shall I then beget children? And Noah was a just man. He was perfect in his generation. And Yahuwah chose him to raise up seed from his seed upon the face of the earth. And Yahuwah said unto Noah, Take unto you a wife, and beget children. For I have seen you righteous before me in this generation. And you shall raise up seed, and your children with you, in the midst of the earth. 
And Noah went and took a wife, and he chose Naamah, the daughter of Enoch, and she was 580 years old. And Noah was 498 years old when he took Naamah for wife. So we don't really need to talk about these age differences anymore, right? <laughs> well, just kidding. And Naamah conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Yapheth, saying, Elohim has enlarged me in the earth. And she conceived again and bare a son, and he called his name Shem, saying, Elohim has made me a remnant to raise up seed in the midst of the earth. And Noah was 502 years old when Naamah bare Shem. And the boys grew up and went in the ways of Yahuwah, and all that Methuselah and Noah their father taught them. And Lamech the father of Noah died in those days, yet verily he did not go with all his heart in the ways of his father. And he died in the 195th year of the life of Noah. And all the days of Lamech were 777 years old, and he died. And all the sons of men who knew Yahuwah died in that year before Yahuwah brought evil upon them. For Yahuwah willed them to die so as not to, beho so as not to behold the evil that Elohim would bring upon their brothers and relatives as he had so declared to do. That's, that's, a, that's a merciful Elohim. And that day Yahuwah said to Noah and Methuselah, Stand forth and proclaim to the sons of men all the words that I spoke to you in those days. Peradventure they may turn from their evil ways, and I will repent of the evil and will not bring it. So this is a merciful Elohim. This wasn't like, eh, I don't like all you guys. I'm just going to start over. He gave them time. And Noah and Methuselah stood forth and said in the ears of the sons of men all that Elohim had spoken concerning them. But the sons of men would not hearken, neither would they incline their ears to all their declarations. And it was after this that Yahweh said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me on account of their evil deeds and behold I will destroy the earth and do you take and do you take unto you gopher wood and go to a certain place and make a large ark and place in it in that spot and thus shall you make it 300 cubits its length 50 cubits broad and 30 cubits high and you shall make unto you a door open at its side and to a cubit thou shalt finish it above and cover it within and without with atonement bitch and, I will beho and behold, I will bring the flood of waters upon the earth, and all flesh be destroyed from under the heavens. All that is upon the earth shall perish. And you and your household shall go and gather two couple of all livings, male and female, and shall bring them to the ark to raise up seed from them upon the earth. And gather unto you all food that is eaten by the animals, that there may be food for you and for them. And you shall choose for your sons three maidens from the daughters of men, and they shall be wives to your sons. And Noah rose up, and he made the ark in the place where Elohim had commanded him. And Noah did as Elohim had ordered him. In his 595th year, Noah commenced to make the ark, and he made the ark, and he made the ark in five years, as Yahweh commanded. Then Noah took the three daughters of Eliakim, son of Methuselah, for wives for his son, as Yahweh had commanded Noah. And it was at the at that time Methuselah, son of Enoch, died. Nine hundred and sixty years old was he at his death. So, with that, um, <clears throat> you know, again, maybe there were some nice people, um, but just didn't follow Yah. You know, is that just just to think about? You know, even today, I'm sure there's lots of nice people that are going to die. Unless they turn to Yah. He's given us plenty of time. He's given us 2,000 years to to believe in his son and to come back to his ways. He's been very long-suffering and merciful. All right, so with that being said, let's read chapter 7 together, and then we will talk about it. Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 7. And Yahweh said unto Noah, Come, you and all your house, into the ark. For you have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast you shall take to you by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that Yahweh commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his women, and his sons' women with him, into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts, 
and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creeps upon the earth. There went in two and two unto El Noah, into the ark, the male and the female, as Elohim had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's women, and the three women of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, of every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as Elohim had commanded him, and Yahweh shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bore up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, and of cattle, and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heavens, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. Mm. Hard times. Oh, man. And again, I'm just wanting to re remind ourselves of the severity and the seriousness of the situation and recognizing that he may not be coming to destroy everything with a flood, but he is coming back. And I think there's this most Christians have this p picture of uh, the Messiah painted as this, you know, hippie, fun loving. Uh, everyone's everyone's good. Just love, you know, and, and he's coming back with love and and flowers and what he's coming back with a sword and he's coming out back with fire and chariots of fire and i think the world is just still asleep so uh let's just pray real quick father yahweh abba we just come before you and uh father i i, I just have a feeling that everyone most people that are listening to this father have a i have a circumcised heart to you that wants to walk in your ways and is awake to the truth of of your word and the falsehoods of this world, Father, help us to be lights to shine brightly for you to be like lighthouses, like a like a, um, just like a lighthouse, Father. And we just pray that you, you'd give us divine appointments in our lives, all of us, uh, that we may share your truth, Father. And we just ask that you'd give us favor and power of the Spirit in Yahushua's name, Amen. All right, so let's talk about chapter seven a little bit. Um, First, I'd like to go to verse 8. 7, 8 says, and, and and know that there's always so much more that I want to talk about, but if I want to talk about everything I want to talk about these four portions, they'd be like four or five hours long. It wouldn't be very realistic. So, <clears throat> of all clean beasts and of all beasts that are not clean and of fowls and everything that creeps upon the earth, what what stands out to you here in this verse? I'll let you shout it out at home. What stands out about beasts that are clean and uh, that are not clean? Um, clean and clean, right? Obviously, we knew that that shows us that there the Torah existed before Mount Sinai. We talked about this last week, but just a reminder, here's another witness. There's many witnesses, but I, I love this one specifically because we, a lot of us in the faith like to point to uh, Abraham. 
Genesis 26, 5. This is talking to Isaac, but about Abraham, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So for, you know, this is just, this is just um, talking points for those of you, because I, I usually, um, people say, oh, the law was, just, that was just given to Israel and, and, and Mount Sinai. And what about Abraham? Abraham was before the law. Eh, not true. Neither was Noah either. Um, uh, and apparently not even Enoch. Uh, the law existed before Enoch. Enoch taught most of the sons of men the law. Uh, and they kept it for a while, but of course they went back to their old ways. Um, also, you know, just speaking of the flood in general, uh, Peter likens the ark and, and the flood uh, and baptism uh, in, a, in an interesting way. First Peter 3, 20 through 22 says, which sometime were obedient, disobedient. When once the long suffering of Elohim waited in the days of Noah, 120 years, he's like, hey, I'm gonna give you 120 years. While the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, so this is not like a standard shower or bath where you're just getting dirt off your flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards Elohim that cleanses the mind, it cleanses the ruach by the resurrection of Yahushua HaMashiach, who has gone into the heaven and is on the right hand of Elohim, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Hallelujah. So this whole story of the ark and being saved through the water was a foreshadow. Peter says, "Who who was pretty cool with Messiah? They were they were they were pretty close there." Um, I'm assuming Messiah taught him this that that the the flood, the ark, Noah, this whole thing was a, a figure, a, a shadow of of what was to come with baptism. So, praise God. So when someone wants to say, hey, "What was baptism in in the the Old Testament?" Right here. Right here. So let's go to verse 11. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven. So, just, again, just considering what most of us have been taught through mainstream uh, science and the education system, what are the fountains of the great deep um, when we look at something like this? When we have, uh, of course, the crust and the mantle, which is all like hot lava, liquid stuff. Where are the fountains of the deep on this model? I, I don't I don't understand. Where are the windows of heaven? Where are the windows of heaven being opened? Because it's it, people say, well, that's just figurative, like where it's raining cats and dogs, but it's not obviously raining cats and dogs. It's it's raining water. Uh, they say people say that uh, the windows of heaven are figurative and the fountains of the deep are figurative, but I don't know. You know. Um, some of us, uh, let's see. Some of us take a a much more um, uh, a much more. Um, oh, I'm trying to pull this here. Why are you? Sorry. Um. Let's go with. Um, Right, something like this that actually does, I mean, whether this is actually what it looks like, I don't know, but we see a great deep here, uh, the foundations of heaven, the fountains of the deep. We see here, we see the windows of heaven. Uh, and remember, in last week, we talked about the waters above the heaven uh, and uh, the waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament. So there's a separation of water above the sky. There's water above the sky and there's, of course, water below the sky, which you know we, we know and see and enjoy. So something, the windows of heaven opened up and water came pouring in and then water came pummeling up. I'll be honest, when I was at, uh, when I was at the, um, the Grand Canyon last year, I couldn't help but think, what caused all this? I wonder, could have the Grand Canyon and, and other areas like the Grand Canyon all over the earth, could those be some of the locations of the fountains of the deep where it says they, it just says they broke open? Uh, yeah, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And so did these things just open up and just just move mountains, move earth all the way? Uh, which makes me wonder why there's so much petrified wood in that area. Uh, it is evidence of just a lot of water and then things being encased and being preserved, petrified, if you will. Um, so again, not to poke at anyone's um, 
understanding of the earth. But for me, you know, is this a perfect model? Probably not. No, none of us, it says we can't measure heaven. We can't measure the breadth of the earth. So nobody has a perfect map. Uh, and, and that's, that's, that's kind of a straw man when people say, you know, poke at this, but I mean, what's this? Honestly, what is this? When I look at the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven, I just don't understand. Maybe you can help me out asking for a friend. Help me out. Okay. Um, a couple of passages about the, let's see. Let's go to Enoch 55, seven through 10. And it says, In those days shall punishment come from Yahuwah of spirits, and he will open all the chambers of waters which are above the heavens. So this is not some metaphorical thing. Uh, this is a literal opening of something. It says, will open the chambers of waters which are above the heavens. And, and you know, and it says, And of the fountains which are beneath the earth. These are not figurative. Sorry, these are literal. And all the waters shall be joined with the waters. That which is above the heavens is a masculine, and the water which is beneath the earth is feminine. So what it's saying is the waters will be meeting each other. So the water will become gushing down here, and the water will be rushing up here, and it will meet each other. And we'll see that in um, we'll see that here in one of the uh, the parables of Enoch uh, a little bit later. Uh, let's go to I couldn't open the link. Let's go to chapter. 77 uh, let's see 50, 60, it's 80 70 50 60 70 71 oh yeah 77 1 through 6 yeah there we go and again I saw how they began to gore each other and to devour each other and the earth began to cry aloud this is the the wickedness the days of noah and i raised my eyes again to heaven i saw in the vision and behold there came forth from heaven beings who were like white men and four went with went forth from that place and three with them and those three that had come last come forth and grasped me by my hand and took me up away from the generations of the earth and raised me up to a lofty place and showed me a tower raised high above the earth and the hills were lower and one said unto me here uh, remain here till you see everything that befalls those elephants, camels, and asses, and the stars, and the oxen, and all of them. And then it says here, um, uh, no. Man, I, was it the previous one? No. Give me just a second. Here we go. And one of those four went, went to that white bull and instructed him, this is Noah, in secret without his being terrified. And he was born a bull and became a man. This is like a dream vision. And built for himself a great vessel, the ark, and dwelt thereon. And three bulls dwelt with him in that vessel, his son, and they were covered in. And again, I raised my eyes toward the heaven and saw a lofty roof with seven water torrents thereon. And those water torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure. This is kind of what we're seeing here. And I saw again, and behold, fountains were opened on the surface of that great enclosure, and that water began to swell and rise upon the surface. And I saw that enclosure till all its surface was covered with water. And the water, the darkness, and the mist, the mist increased upon it. And I looked at the height of that water, that that water had risen above the height of that enclosure, and it was streaming over that enclosure, and it stood upon the earth. And all the cattle that enclosure were gathered together until I saw how they sank and were swallowed up and perished in that water. But that vessel floated on the water while all the oxen and elephants and camels and asses sank to the bottom with all the animals so that I could no longer see them. And they were not able to escape, but perished and sank into the depths. So uh, just some some verses showing that there is an, a literal enclosure. Um here we go. Second Ezra 4, 1 through 12 says this. Then the angel that had been sent to me, whose name was Uriel, answered and said to me, Your understanding has utterly failed regarding this world. And do you think you can comprehend the way of the Most High? Then I said, Yes, my master. And he replied to me, I have been sent to show, to show you three ways and to put before you three problems. If you can solve one of them for me, I will also show you the way you desire to see and will teach you why the heart is evil. I said, Speak on, my master. 
And he said to me, Go away for me the weight of fire, or measure for me a measure of wind, or call back for me the day that is past. I answered and said, Who of those that have been born can do this, that you ask me concerning these things? He said to me, If I had asked you how many dwellings are in the heart of the sea, or how many streams are at the source of the deep, or how many streams are above the firmament, or which are the exits of hell, or which are the entrances of paradise, perhaps you would have said to me, I never went down into the deep, nor as yet into hell, neither did I ever ascend into heaven. But now I have asked you only about fire and wind and the day, things through which you have passed and without which you cannot exist. And you have given me no answer about them. And he said to me, you cannot understand the thing. You cannot understand the things which you have grown up with. How then can your mind comprehend the way the most high? And how can one who is already worn out by the corrupt world understand incorruption? When I heard this, I fell on my face and said to him, it would be better for us not to be here than to come here and live in ungodliness and to suffer and not understand why. So probably should have just read these verses that were parallel to what we're talking about here, but just another uh, another witness. Um, and again, remember Genesis 1, 7 said, And Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Let's take a look at the Jasher account, chapter 6. We're going to read chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 27, and just get a little more detail about the flood story. Because I don't know about you, I like the extra details. And that's what the book of Jasher does. It gives us those extra details of what was going on. Jasher 6, 1-27 through 27. At that time, after the death of Methuselah, Yahweh said to Noah, Go with your household into the ark. Behold, I will gather to you all the animals of the earth, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and they shall come and surround the ark. So think about that. I mean, that makes a little more sense than Noah having to go into the forest or the woods and... Oh, Catch those deer. <sighs> Japheth, go catch that deer. <sighs> okay. All right. Have you ever tried? <laughs> How about even a sheep? Try catching a sheep that's running away from you. How about a lion or a tiger or I'm not going to go there or hyenas or whatever. So it says here that Yah gathered all the animals for him. And you, and listen to this, and you shall go and seat yourself by the doors of the ark and all the beasts, the animals and the fowls shall assemble and place themselves before you. Can you imagine going to go try to rescue all the spiders <laughs> or, the, or the snakes, right? This had to be a supernatural event. This is not them just going and caging some, some rabbits and some birds. Okay, so all the animals and fowls shall assemble and place themselves before you and such of them as shall come and crouch before you or bow or humble themselves, you shall take and deliver into the hands of your sons who shall bring them into the ark and all that will stand before you, you shall leave. So if they are proud and not humble, they're out, basically, he says. And Yahweh brought this about on the next day and animals and beasts and fowls came in great multitudes and surrounded the ark. Oh, man, his social media was only a, around back then. And Noah went, and oh, I say social media, I mean, just being the, the uh, let's just talk about media. Man, if someone got, caught some pictures or some uh, some video of that, <laughs> wow. And Noah went and seated himself by the door of the ark, and of all flesh that crouched before him, he brought into the ark. And all that stood before him, he left upon the earth. And a lioness came with her two whelps, male and female. And the three crouched before Noah, and the two whelps rose up against the lioness and smote her and made her flee from the place, and she went away. And they returned to their places and crouched upon the earth before Noah. And the lioness ran away and stood in the place of the lions. And Noah saw this and wondered greatly, and he rose and took the two whelps and brought them into the ark. And Noah brought into the ark from all living creatures that were upon the earth, so that there was none left but which Noah brought into the ark. Two and two came to Noah into the ark, but from the clean animals and clean fowls he brought seven couples as Elohim had commanded him. And all the animals and beasts and fowl were still there, and they surrounded the ark at every place, and the rain had not descended till seven days after. And on that day Yahweh caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, and the lightning flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the fountains in the earth were broken up, such as was not known to the inhabitants before. And Elohim did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men, that there might be no more evil upon the earth. And still the sons of men would not return from their evil ways. And they increased the anger of Yahweh at that time and did not even direct their hearts to all this. This is why these things happen in these last days. It's like 
he, he doesn't send these things just as just, ha, 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 I'm going to get you, you little ants. Think about, I mean, I can just think about COVID, okay? Think about that whole pandemic. Whatever that was, how a lot of people came to the truth of that because their world was rocked. Their life changed. They couldn't, they couldn't just go to Walmart at midnight anymore because it closed at 10. I mean, think of the audacity of that. I'm just, obviously, I'm just, I'm being silly, but but truly a lot of people's lives changed. Uh, you know, kids didn't go to school for a while. You had a, a lot of people had to wear these masks. Well, some people didn't do so, but, um, that was, uh, whatever it was, even if it was just, you know, not even a real pestilence, but that, that think of that pestilence that came changed a lot of people's lives. Got them thinking about it. how many people maybe lost people in an earthquake or, or a tsunami or a tornado or whatever that maybe got them thinking about their lives. Like, man, I could have lost my life too, or I lost my mom. I lost my, my brother or sister. These the, these kind of life changing events is what gets people's attention sometimes, and of course sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it says here, and still the sons of men would not turn from their evil ways, and they increased the anger of Yahweh that time, and did not even direct their hearts to all this. But it says that's why he did that. Like, hey, maybe in these last days, that's why Messiah says there will be. Uh, um, uh, wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and diver diverse places and all these different things to maybe get the attention of the sons of men. Hey, turn to me. At the end of seven days in the 600th year of the life of Noah, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And all the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And Noah and his household and all the living creatures that were with him came into the ark on account of the waters of the flood and Yahweh shut him in. And all the sons of men that were left upon the earth became exhausted through evil on account of the rain, for the waters were coming more violently upon the earth, and the animals and beasts were still surrounding the ark. And the sons of men assembled together about 700,000 men and women. They came unto Noah into the ark, and they called unto Noah, saying, Open for us that we may come into the ark, and wherefore shall we die? And Noah with a loud voice answered them from the ark, saying, Have you not all rebelled against Yahuwah and said that he does not exist? And therefore Yahuwah brought upon you this evil to destroy and cut you off from the face of the earth. Is not this the thing that I spoke to you of 120 years back, and you would not hearken to the voice of Yahuwah? And now do you desire to live upon the earth? And they said to Noah, We are ready to return to Yahuwah. Only open for us that we may live and not die. Noah answered them, saying, Behold, now that you see the trouble of your souls, you wish to return to Yahuwah. Why did you not return during these 120 years which Yahuwah granted you as a determined period? So hard times is supposed to get us thinking about our lives and to return to Yah. That's my story. He brought hard times. Oh, I, actually, let me rephrase it. I brought hard times upon myself. He saw it and allowed it, of course. And these are some of the things that brought me back and got me thinking, what am I doing with my life? Why? Well, how did I get here? I need your help. Help me. I want to be for real now. For them, it was too late. They were given a determined period. And just like that, and that's why he says, like the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. They're basically carrying on and then done. It's gone. When he returns, it's over. Oh, now that you see me coming in the clouds with great power and glory, oh, now you want to believe. It's too late. Sorry. But now you come and tell me this on the account of the troubles of your soul. Now also Yahweh will not listen to you, neither will he give ear to you on this day, so that you will not now succeed in your wishes. And the sons of men approached in order to break into the ark, to come in on account of the rain, for they could not bear the rain upon them. And Yahweh sent all the beasts and animals that stood around the ark, and the beasts overpowered them and drove them from that place. And every man went on his way, and they again scattered themselves upon the face of the earth. And the rain was still descending upon the earth, and it descended forty days and forty nights, and the waters prevailed greatly upon the earth. And all flesh that was upon the earth or in the waters died, whether men, animals, beasts, creeping things, or birds of the air, and there only remained Noah and those that were with him in the ark. We'll stop there for now. So, and also, of course, in the last days, Revelation 9, 20 through 21, when all these plagues are happening, the sun of scorched men, waters dry up, the, the green grass is burnt up, uh, the sun and the moon change their order, earthquakes, pestilences, wars, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. This is prophecy to come, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear 
nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. What a merciful Elohim that we have, that even to this last moment, he'd be willing to forgive us all. People who murder, people who commit sorceries or, or participate in sorceries or fornication, he's, he's like, come back to me, even in the very, very last days, and praise Yah that he allowed people like me and you to repent and to change our ways. Hallelujah. Are we perfect? Oh, I can tell you I'm not. I want to be, and I strive to be every day. A righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. These people did not want to repent nor get up from their folly. Let's go to, um, actually, we're, let's go to chapter 8 now. Let's go to chapter 8. Chapter 8. So... Let's do it. Ready, set, go. Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 8. And Elohim remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And Elohim made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters were decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountain seen. And it came to pass, at the end of forty days, that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also, he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, the earth was dried. And Elohim spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, you and your woman, and your sons and your sons' women with you. Bring forth with you every living thing that is with you, of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his woman, and his sons' women with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creeps upon the earth after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto Yahuwah, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Yahuwah smelled a sweet savor, and Yahuwah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Okay, <clears throat> we're back. Praise Yah. Um, is my camera fixed? Is it fixed? Did some of you, one of you pray for me? Did somebody out there pray and it just got fixed? Praise Yah. So far, so good. Okay, so let's talk about chapter 8. There's a few things I want to discuss. Um, a lot of people have, have taken a stab at uh, um, the different uh, shadows and, and, and what the 
raven and the dove symbolizes. I'm going to take a shot myself here. Um, I, I think there's something interesting here. So we see how he sends out the raven that, uh, let's see, let's start here. The raven which went forth to and fro, this is an interesting term here, to and fro, until the waters were dried up from off the earth. So he sent out the raven and the raven never came back. Of course, he sent the dove uh, to see if it was. The dove found no rest. So she returned to him in the ark, right? Um, then pulled her back in, then waited another seven days, sent the, uh, the dove out. The dove came in with an olive leaf plucked off. We know that the olive tree is a symbol for uh, the children of Israel. Um, and uh, then he sent it out again and it didn't come back. We see some interesting verbiage here, actually, in Enoch 42. I like to read for you. And we know that the dove is symbol is a symbol of um, the, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. And I don't know why you aren't working. So why aren't you working? There we go. Okay. So, of course, here, Luke 3.22, it says, And the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, descended upon him, Messiah, in bodily form as a dove. So we know that the dove could be a symbol for the Spirit, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Wisdom, uh, whatever you want to call it. So let's go back to the book of Enoch. It says, Wisdom found no place where she might dwell. So something like uh, uh, the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. Wisdom found no place where she might dwell. Then a dwelling place was assigned her in the heavens, so she came back. So obviously the, the spirit started with in the heavens. It was sent to the earth, found no place because of all the wickedness, came back. Wisdom went forth to make her dwelling among the children of men and found no dwelling place because everyone is evil. Wisdom returned to her place, so the dove returned, right, and took her seat among the angels. And unrighteousness went forth from her chambers, whom she sought, not she found, and dwelt with him. It's kind of like the, the raven that, that went sent forth and never came back uh, as rain in a, in a desert and dew on a thirsty land. Um, so we we also want to read Sirach 4, 11 through 19. And just a couple things here about the spirit of wisdom. It says, Wisdom exalts her sons and gives help to those who seek her. Whoever loves her loves life, and those who seek her early will be filled with joy. Whoever holds her fast will obtain glory, and Yahweh will bless the place she enters. Those who serve her will minister to the Holy One. Yahweh loves those who love her. He who obeys her will judge the nations, and whoever gives heed to her will dwell secure. If he has faith in her, he will obtain her, and, if, and his descendants will remain in possession of her. For at first she will walk with him on torturous paths, and she will bring fear and cowardice upon him, and will torment her, him by her discipline until she trusts him. And she will test him with her ordinances. Then she will come straight back to him and gladden him. This is like that dove returning and will reveal her secrets to him. If he goes astray, she will forsake him and hand him over to his room. This is someone, of course, that Hebrews 10, 26, those who willfully sin, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Now, that's the kind of uh, going the wrong way, at least in my opinion, uh, from what I understand. Uh, liquid, hot magma, inner core, mantle crust. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> so then, of course, the raven, it says the raven uh, was sent forth to it and went to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Uh, so basically, it was wandering around the earth, uh, seeking, uh, of course, what it could. Uh, Job 1, 6 through 7 says, Now there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah, and Satan came also among them. And Yahuwah said unto Satan, Whence from whence do you come? Satan answered Yahuwah and said, from going to to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So is that really solidify that the raven was representing a different different spirit? Not really, uh, but just some, some things to share. Uh, let's go to Genesis 8, 17. It says, Bring forth with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So let's just be honest. Yahuwah made this earth to be inhabited, made to be uh, for us to multiply. It is the first commandment given to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. Like, make more of yourselves. He made us that way to, to for the two flesh to become one and to produce another. 
And so uh, this is something very opposite of what modern day society teaches us. Like you remember even in China, they were only allowed to have like one or was it one or two children uh, for some time. And even if, if they had like a girl that they would like, I don't know, I don't even want to talk about it. Um, but they say that, you know, Earth, we're killing ourselves, that humans are like a plague and we're causing uh, climate change and, and, and um, we're going to run, run out of resources and Earth is going to die. And so basically encouraging people to not to multiply. Of course, they're encouraging that through the LGBT and, and trans and all this stuff that doesn't multiply. Uh, so it's going against the natural order of things. And, and and I know some of you out there listening, you may have never had children. Maybe you didn't have the opportunity to, maybe uh, for health reasons, maybe it just never worked out. And I'm, this is definitely not uh, um, poking fun or whatever, but those of us who can reproduce, reproduce. Well, what's, 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 cause society tells you they're too expensive and you should only have one or two, like get out of here. Uh, who, who provides, who owns all the silver and the gold and the digits on the screen? Yeah. You know, everything is yours, right? Everything is his. Uh, so be fruitful, multiply. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people, more people that have, have traveled a lot more than me. I've, I've traveled quite a bit around this world. Uh, and even just looking from a plane, when you look down, it's like so such a small portion of this world is inhabited. You look at these big cities and it just seems so like so populated and oh, we're running out of room. Just get outside the city and get in the country. And there's so much empty space. When I flew to Africa, uh, I like I like getting window seats. I like looking out. And it's like even in Af like even in Africa, it's like hardly any of the area was inhabited. This the book of two Esdras which we mentioned uh, last week is uh, was part of the the biblical canon for ma for many years. Um, it said that that the earth has an unfailing table and an inexhaustible pasture, as in he created enough resources to last us forever. Of course, uh, but man, you know, teaches something differently. So being fruitful and multiply, and, and those of you that you know are married and maybe you ha you're still of, of childbearing age, which <laughs> we know is any age according to the, uh, the next couple Torah portions we'll be going over when we talk about Abraham and Sarah. Um, pray about it. If you if you have one or two and you're, you're convinced, oh, we can't afford the rest, pray about it. Ask Yah, you know, can we afford it? Uh, will you help us? Maybe be a, a test of, of faith. Um, um, just something to think about because this is part of life is to to reproduce and again no, nothing uh this is definitely no ill will or uh definitely no no pointing fingers or judging for those of you that have not had children um you know maybe this your circumstances didn't allow that and so be it you know um, Isaiah 54 says, even to the barren woman, uh, those who come into New Jerusalem, uh, it'll be better than having sons and daughters, right So um, Let's go to verse 821. It says, And Yahweh smelled a sweet savor, and Yahweh said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. So, uh-oh, hold on. We get to know a little bit about our creator. He likes the smell of a barbecue. Newsflash. So do I. Praise Yah for meat. There's a lot, some doctrines going around saying that the better way to live or the healthier way to live is, is, uh, is without meat. I disagree. I think if you get the right meat... Um, I would highly dis highly disagree. I think meat is for us, and he, he created it for us. And our Heavenly Father certainly does like the smell of that sweet savor or whatever was going on on that altar there. Hey, right here. Um, so, let's go to verse 22. It says, While the earth remains, sea time, harvest time, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. However, until the end times, when we look at the book of Revelation, it's basically the natural order of things is just completely interrupted. Uh, the earth dies, basically. And then, of course, he renews it again. I don't think he's going to throw this whole earth away and start over. I believe he's just going to, the, the earth is literally going to die. When you look at the book of Revelation, uh, the wind ceases. Uh, even science will tell you if, if wind stopped, that's it. Life, there's like life for a couple months and that's it. If, if the sun was darkened for an extended period of time, if the moon didn't shine, certain plants wouldn't grow. Yah created this order perfectly. And if that order, if he, if he stops that order, everything dies. Let's go to Enoch 79. Oh, I already have it up here. We're going to go to Enoch 79, at least in the Ethiopic. I don't know what it is in the Arch Charles. <clears throat> 
It says, here, here, here. In those days, Uriel answered and said to me, Behold, I have shown you all things, O Enoch, and all things have I revealed to you that you see the sun, the moon, and those which conduct the stars of heaven, which cause all their operations, seasons, and arrivals to return. Uh, in other chapters, we learn that the angels are in charge over all the operations of Yah. Yah doesn't have to do everything. He can create, and he's created these angels to, to be his ministers and to do what he's asked them to do. So if he creates an angel to make sure the moon goes in its course, that's what he does. If he's created an angel to make sure the sun keeps doing its thing, that's what it does. In the days of sinners, the years shall be shortened. Their seed shall be backward in their prolific soil. And everything done on earth shall be subverted and disappear in its season. The rain shall be restrained and heaven shall stand still. That's interesting. In those days, the fruits of the earth shall be late and not flourish in their season. And in their season, the fruits of the trees shall be withholden. The moon shall change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. But in those days shall heaven be seen and barrenness shall take place in the borders of the great chariot of the west. Heaven shall shine more than when illuminated by the orders of the light, while many chief among the stars of authority shall err, perverting their ways. So I want to pause here real quickly. It says heaven shall be seen. Why? Because the firmament just got destroyed. It got burned up with, with fire. Now heaven is being seen. And that's why we don't need the light of the sun or the moon anymore. Because heaven, right? Yahusha, Yahuwah are the light of it. It says those shall not appear in their season who commanded them. And all classes of the stars shall be shut up against the sinners. The thoughts of those who dwell on earth shall transgress within them, and they shall be perverted in all their ways. They shall transgress and think themselves gods, while evil shall be multiplied among them. That's Isn't that where we're at now? I know the superstars and whatnot, I think they're gods. The actresses and the high society think they're gods, and they're just teaching the people to worship them as gods. And then, of course, you've got false doctrines that say we are we are Messiah, we are, uh, uh, we are the I Ams, we are the... Um, uh, Christ consciousness, all this false new agey, self-worshipping false doctrine. And Enoch prophesied of it many, many years ago. Um, let's take a look at Jasher, the book Jasher, uh, chapter 6, verse 28. We'll start there. And the ark floated upon the face of the waters, and it was tossed upon the waters, so that all the living creatures within were turned about like pottage in a cauldron. And great anxiety seized all the living creatures that were in the ark, and the ark was like to be broken. So, uh, usually, usually the pictures of Noah's ark it's floating on this nice calm water. Yeah, maybe after the storm was over, but think about the storm. You don't think that was a wild ride? So this is why I like the book of Jasher. It gives these details. It gives me a, a, a more of an understanding of what happened. And because when you read, you can just go right past and just not even think about all the animals and like all the, the, the tigers roaring and the lions roaring and the, and the pigs squealing and the dogs barking and the wolves howling. It says, and all the living creatures that were in the ark were terrified and the lions roared, the oxen lowed, the wolves howled, and every living creature in the ark spoke and lamented in its own language so that their voices reached to a great distance. And Noah and his sons cried and wept in their troubles. They were greatly afraid that they had reached the gates of death and Noah prayed unto Yahuwah. So it's normal that we're, we can get nervous or scared or terrified, but we take that and we give it to Yah and say, Yah, we're going to trust in you. And cried unto him on account of this. And he said, O oh, Yahuwah, help us, for we have no strength to bear this evil that has encompassed us. For the waves of the water have surrounded us. Mischievous torrents have terrified us. The snares of death have come before us. Answer us, O oh, Yahuwah, answer us. Light up your countenance towards us and be gracious to us. Redeem us and deliver us. And Yahweh hearkened to the voice of Noah, and Yahweh remembered him. And a wind passed over the earth, and the waters were still, and the ark rested. And the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters decreased in those days, and the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. And Noah opened the windows of the ark, and Noah still called out to Yahweh at that time and said, O Yahweh, who did form the earth and the heavens and all that are therein, Bring forth our souls from this confinement and from the prison wherein you have placed us, for I am much wearied with sighing. Speaking of Ararat, it's interesting. There's a lot been there's been a few um, people saying that they found the the Noah's Ark over the years, but I actually believe the Ron Wyatt story. If you haven't seen it, just type Ron Wyatt uh, Noah's Ark, and hopefully you'll find the right, right documentary. Absolutely blessed me. 
uh, to see that they, I really believe they have found the remnants of Noah's Ark. Um, it's just absolutely, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's just absolutely amazing. Um, so uh, just to finish up on chapter eight, just a couple things. Um, you know, so for those of you that were watching the last two years, you remember last two years I included the Aramaic targums in the study. I don't think I'm going to do that anymore because um, the more and more I've read the targums, the more I just recognize there's just a lot of Jewish um, in rab rabbinical insertions there. Do I believe there's truth in it? Yes. Um, in a very similar way, uh, I've done the same thing with the Book of Jubilees. Uh, um, I'm actually, after the Passover is over, um, right now I'm actually at the campground where we're doing Passover. We're setting up uh, for Passover here in, a, in less than a week. But after that's over, I'm going to be finishing up a study of something that I've been putting off for three years, um, why I, I no longer um, support the Book of Jubilees. And I'll be, uh, that, that may disappoint many of you out there, um, I know that this ministry had introduced a lot of people in the Torah movement to the Book of Jubilees, so I find it that it's my responsibility to share why I now no longer support that book. Uh, is there truth in the Book of Jubilees? Definitely. Uh, is there leaven in it? Definitely. And this is why I'm staying away from it. Same thing with the Targums. I recognize, and so that study will come out here in a few weeks, and I'll give you all the reasonings. So don't don't uh, come at me with the pitchforks just yet. Uh, at least see my reasonings before you do so. Um, same thing with the Targums. There's definitely truth in it, and and I may reference it here and there, but I, I no longer want to recommend people go read that, read that uh, just because there's just too much leaven. Um, but I do want to just mention the Targum it, it, in this in Genesis eight. It says, "And Noah built the the altar before Yahuwah, that altar which Adam had built it in the time when he was cast forth from the Garden of Eden, and had offered an oblation upon it, and upon it." had Cain and Abel offered their oblations. But when the waters of the deluge descended, it was destroyed and Noah rebuilt it. Um, there's also a link here for First Adam and Eve, chapters 23 through 25. Um, if that book is true, shows the uh, the origin of um, of the sacrificial system. And it, it actually may surprise you of where that came from. So you don't need to have a look it up. I have all the links for everything here. So um, uh, when I say here in my study notes, and I'll, and I'll always put the study notes in the description box below uh, where the video is. So if you want to go back and reference any of these uh, chapters or any of these uh, other books or things that I'm mentioning, everything is in the study notes. So with that, let's go to chapter nine. nine. Also in the, in the Targums, it says, Says that um, Messiah basically says, and the word of Yahuwah closed in Noah uh, upon the ark. So the one thing nice is about the Targums that it shows our Messiah very, very clearly. Um, so let's go to chapter nine, and uh, let's listen in. Bereshit, Genesis chapter nine, and Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fish of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but the flesh with the life thereof which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of Elohim made he man. And you, be ye fruitful, and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And Elohim spoke Sorry. unto Noah, and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And Elohim said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you 
and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And Elohim said unto Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, and Chem, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be Yahuwah Elohai of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Elohim shall enlarge Yahweh, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. Okay, praise yeah. Sorry about that interruption in the middle of that. I didn't actually didn't mean to click that link. I was trying to make a quick note. I like this. I like when we do it like this because I just I feel like I'm able to think of some things uh, on the on the spot here. But so Genesis nine six says, "Whoso sheds man's blood by man's shall his blood be shed. For in the image of Elohim made he man." And that's something that um, it still exists today. So even people that are just completely lost, murderers. Uh, drunkards, revelers, um, people who are even in the LGB, you know, what movement and trans, whatever. These are still, well, not everyone may not be in the image of Elohim, but they were made that way and everyone has the ability to repent. And so I just don't want to follow what mainstream Christianity does, which is just point the finger at people like this and, and, and sit there and talk trash about them, which is interesting because they're basically... They're basically pointing at them for not keeping the law, for doing things against the law. But most of mainstream Christianity is contrary to law anyways. So it's done away with. Well, if the law is done away with, then why are you worried about people who are, you know, uh, LGB? My point is, we should be the light. We're not here to uh, condemn man or to de even destroy man. Uh, we're here to, to help point men to salvation, point them to Messiah point them to redemption, point them to uh, really truly walking back in the image of Elohim. We know that Messiah is the perfect image of Yah. That's how we're, and we're supposed to follow him and be like him. So we're, we're not here to condemn people, to, to talk, to talk down to them. We're here to point the way and, sh and be examples and show them. So even people that are just completely lost in the world. I mean, where were you? Where were you a couple years ago, a couple months ago for some of you, maybe where were you 10 years ago? You were one of them. I was one of them. I was a heathen completely lost. I got into all sorts of uh, of of, of um, transgression uh, of Yah of Yah's laws. So if He had mercy on someone like me, and maybe some of you, maybe some of you listening, you're maybe you you lived great lives. Maybe you didn't get into all the things that we got into. Praise Yah, but most of us have, and most of the world has. So my point is, is is just our mindset should be. trying to rescue these people just like noah and methuselah were preaching to the sons of men every day almost i didn't say it every day but it pre preached them for 120 years and they had no converts none 
hopefully at least for us maybe we can touch some lives and y'all can can open some eyes um may may we be willing vessels hallelujah let's go to um uh where is it it's this is a passage that a lot of people like to use here to just eat anything they want every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you that word is that that word is food um, however, I think uh, there needs to be a lot more an investigation there. Uh, I pulled up here, uh, Noah, uh, could he eat all things? Well, I think 119, 119 Ministries did an excellent uh, job on this. So I'll have a link for this in the, um, the study notes if you want to watch. If you're like, well, hmm, that makes it sound like we should be able to eat anything. I think they did a great job um, of sharing that. So let's go to uh, verse 17. It says, uh, and Elohim said, this is the sign of the covenant. This is the rainbow, which I have established between me and the flesh. So the rainbow was supposed to be a sign between Yah and his people and the Torah that we're to abide by. But of course, um, we know that that symbol has been o not overtaken, but altered, augmented. Uh, thankfully, uh, they actually took one of the colors away. There's seven colors of the rainbow, as you probably know. Uh, the LGB one is six uh, colors. So at least they didn't make an exact copy. They took what Yah made and took away from it and um, said, well, this is ours. Well, surely that six color one, that's all yours. But the rainbow is still Yah's. And uh, uh, was it, is it Bryson Gray? It says, take back the rainbow, I think. Anyways, um, good stuff. So other groups have taken what Yah made and defiled it, right? Uh, Yahusha comes back with the rainbow nonetheless. So Yahusha does uh, reinstate the rainbow. If you if you weren't familiar, it's here in Revelation 10. And it says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet were pillars of fire. We know from this and this, that this is the descriptor of Messiah. We know that Messiah, uh, and actually if we just keep reading it, it says that he had a book uh, in his hand, a little book open. This is the book with the seven seals that we know only he could open. Because uh, I know some people have a problem with Messiah being a, a mighty angel, but we know that he is the angel of the covenant, the messenger of the covenant. He is the angel of Yahuwah. Not that he's at the same level as angels. He's way far above all powers and principalities. He's at the right hand of, of Yah. Um, even though he didn't uh, portray himself to be equal with Elohim, he you know with with the Father he is. Although Messiah says the Father is greater than I. That's his own words. But the point being is Messiah comes back with a rainbow upon his head. Uh, in short, uh, I'll give you a quick understanding of why I believe what this rainbow is. Obviously, it's a sign of the covenant. He's coming with the covenant, uh, the everlasting covenant. And um, when we look at New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem is built with 12 precious stones. What's interesting is in our day, we live in a day where they have these gemstone light things where you can shine light through a, a gemstone and uh, you shine pure light through it. Um, and certain gems light up all the colors of the rainbows. Others don't like the diamond. If you shine this pure light through it, it's just it's just gray, black and black and white and gray light. Uh, same thing with um, uh, I think a ruby is the same thing. Uh, but if you look at like um, if you look like emeralds and garnets and uh, all the stones that are supposed that that New Jerusalem is to be built with, all those stones shine all seven colors of the light of the rainbow when pure light is shown through it. So what light could be more pure than Messiah? And if Messiah comes with New Jerusalem, this is why I believe that there's going to be a rainbow above his head because New Jerusalem is going to be shining all the colors of the rainbow. To back that up here, if you go to Enoch 55, 1 through 2, it says, After that, the head of days, this is this is the, the Most High, repented and said, In vain have I destroyed all who dwell on the earth. And he swore by his great name, Henceforth, so from this time forward, I will not do so to all who dwell on the earth, and I will set a sign in the heaven, the rainbow, and this shall be a pledge of good faith between me and them forever, so long as heaven is above the earth. We saw earlier in Enoch, uh, in Enoch, uh, up here, but it says, but in those days heaven shall be seen. Why? Because heaven is no longer above the earth. Heaven is right there. The firmament has been destroyed. It's been burnt up. There's no separation between heaven and earth. Heaven has come down. So it says, so long as heaven is above the earth. And this is in accordance with my command. 
Let's take a look at verse 19. It says, These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. In this, in the book of uh, Enoch, chapter 89, we see <clears throat> we see the dream vision. We actually uh, uh, read some of this already, where um, the this bull uh, built for himself a great vessel and dwelt on it, and how the water came up and, in, and uh, filled up that enclosure. Uh, and then let's go down to where, what do we want to read? Where did I want to read? I want to read Enoch 89. I didn't have the verses down. Okay. <clears throat> it says, Then the water began to run down into these till the earth became visible, but that vessel settled on the earth, in the mountains of Ararat, remember, and the darkness retired and light appeared. But that white bull, which had become a man, came out of that vessel and three bulls with him, and one of those three was white like that bull so it says one of them was white like noah and one of them was red as blood and one black and that white bull departed from them which is kind of interesting because um some a lot of the scientific communities would actually agree that everyone alive today came from either a white man a red man or a black man and that's it and that's what the book of enoch teaches and it coincides with what the torah teaches Obviously, we know there's been many mixings. I mean, even even uh, Ishmael, uh, Ishmael was uh, was mixed. Um, uh, we had an Egyptian and a, and a Shemite. You had a Hamite and a Shemite uh, mixing together, and of course, all the Arabs came from that. And so, uh, but everyone again today could be traced back to either a white, a red, or a black man, which I think is pretty cool. And the cool thing is they're all from Yah, and they all came from Noah. So really, uh, like these guys. So if if Enoch is true, which I believe. Uh, Noah had literally a white son, a black son, and a red son. And they were brothers. They were bros, right? They were hanging out. And we should be the same today in the body of Messiah. It doesn't matter if we're black or white or red or yellow or whatever. Um, we know in, in Revelation 7 uh, that all nations, all tribes, all kindreds uh, will, will be in uh, the throne room there praising Yah with palms in their hands and white robes on. So why do we have any kind of um, um, racism in the body? It's, re I mean, it's straight nonsense. Straight nonsense. We should not take part of that at all. It doesn't matter who, I mean, I say it doesn't matter who the true Israelites were as far as the bloodline, whether they were uh, black or white or, or Asian. It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it ma truth is truth. So truth matters. So don't get me wrong, right? So I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But in, the, in where we're at now with preaching the gospel, it doesn't matter. I should be able to preach the gospel the same to any colored individual. And it should not matter because whether you were born naturally in Israel, you're either going to be regrafted back in as a natural branch or you're going to be grafted in as a wild branch, which will take on the characteristics of the rest of the tree. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. So, um, and then, uh, of course, we have the cursing of Canaan. Um, we have this whole situation here. There's been some teachings saying that uh, what Ham did was Ham slept with uh, his mom. Because when you look in Leviticus, uh, it says we're not to look upon the nakedness of our father, which is, uh, you know, his, his wife. Uh, um, and that if you, if you were to uncover the his wife it would be his nakedness so i can understand why people teach that however when really examining this i don't think that's what happened at all um because look at here in verse 23 it says and shem and japheth took a garment and laid it upon both her shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father so did they go backwards and cover ham having intercourse with his mother no obviously not they it, it, i think it was a literal no i just got drunk and he was just laying naked in his bed and ham was like <clears throat> Yo, you guys gonna check this out? Look at what dad. Look at what dad's up to. Come here, come here, come, come, come. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. And of course, Shem and Yafeth were like, no, no. And they didn't look at their dad, and they humbly covered him. Um, I want to read something from the uh, writings of Abraham. This is. This is not to be confused with the book of Abraham. The book of Abraham was a Mormon book. This is the writings of Abraham. Something completely different uh, was found in the library of, uh, of Egypt in the 1800s. Uh, this book continuously confirms uh, Torah observance, something that Mormonism does not do. Uh, they also say the law is done away with uh, and, and many other things. But uh, myself and many others have tested this book, and I believe this is a legitimate book. 
The writings of Abraham, chapter 17, says this, Now, when the flood had abated and the ark had come to rest upon the top of the mountain, Noah and his family descended, and the and after offering sacrifices unto Yahuwah and dedicating the land, they began to till the ground and raise all manner of crops. And when the grape harvest was come in, Noah made wine and drank of the new wine in his tent, and his heart was made glad, and he rejoiced before Yahuwah for the bounty which Yahuwah had given him. And it was upon the feast of Pentecost when Noah drank of the new wine before Yahuwah and lay down naked in his tent to sleep. When Ham, the son of Noah, entered the tent, he saw his father sleeping naked upon his bed with the sacred garments which had been given to Adam in the Garden of Eden laying nearby. Ham knew that he and his posterity could not bear the priesthood because of the curse of Cain which was upon them, and knowing there was great power in this sacred garments, he stole them from his father. Noah and hurried to his tents. Rousing his family, Ham instructed them to strike their tents and led them away to the plain of Shinar, where he dwelt and where Ham died. Now Ham's wife was named Zepta, <clears throat> and she was also the seed of Cain, and they had a daughter named Zepta. This daughter, after the death of Ham, led a body of his people westward until they reached a body of water in the land of Zepta, which is Egypt, where they settled, and the waters receded from off the land, and they spread out and built many cities and temples. Um, we learn also here in the next chapter, it says, Before the death of Ham, the sacred garments were given secretly by him to his son Cush. Cush also kept them hidden. And actually, we'll talk about that when it's time for, for Nimrod. But, um, you know, in one of the books, <laughs> uh, it, it is in, in Jubilees. Um, uh, again, I do believe there's there's truth in this book. Um, it basically said that... Uh, Every tribe was given a land assignment, and uh, Ham's land assignment was given in Africa. Now, when the the um, when the Tower of Babel was destroyed, and they went back, everyone went to their basically their land assignments. Canaan was the only one that didn't, and um, all of Noah's uh, sons and grandsons all warned Canaan, "Hey, if you do this, you're going to be just cursed and destroyed." Uh, and so it's very possible also that um, Noah was prophesying and cursing Canaan for what he was uh, getting ready to do as well. So um, anyways, with that, um, I also actually I want to read Second Ezra 7. This confirms that Noah taught the instruction to all of his sons, the all nations. Second Ezra 17, that no one has any excuse. So people say like, oh, what about, you know, Buddhists living in Thailand, living in the, in the country that's never heard of Yahusha? Well, their forefathers did. And they are suffering, of course, of the decisions that their forefathers made many, many centuries. Now, of course, we should have the heart and go, go find them. Thankfully, we know a brother in the country in Thailand. So, bro, go teach him. <laughs> and keep making music. All right, Second Ezra seven seventeen through twenty five. Then I answered and said, O sovereign master, behold, you have ordained in your Torah that the righteous shall inherit these things, but that the ungodly shall perish. The righteous therefore can endure difficult circumstances while hoping for easier ones, but those who have done wickedly have suffered the difficult circumstances and will not see the easier ones. And he said to me, You are not a better judge than Elohim or wiser than the Most High. Let many perish who are now living rather than the law, the Torah of Elohim, which is set before them, be disregarded. For Elohim strictly commanded those who came into this world when they came what they should do to live and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Nevertheless, they were not obedient and spoke against him. And they devised for themselves vain thoughts and proposed themselves wicked frauds. They even declared that the Most High does not exist and they ignored his ways. They scorned his law and denied his covenants. They have been unfaithful to his statutes and have not performed his works. Therefore, Ezra, empty things are for the empty and full things are for the full. So there's no excuse. All the nations were given. Noah was a righteous man and taught all of his sons the truth. They decided, of course, to walk away from such. So with that, let's go to chapter 10 and let's listen in, shall we? Bereshit, Genesis chapter 9. <clears throat> And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. So, I need to fix that one. Hang on, hang on. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 9. And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every... 
Bereshit, Genesis chapter 9. And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Okay. I must not have had 10 right. So let's read 10 together. Praise Yah. I get to pronounce all these uh, names for you. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Okay, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Yaban, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tirak, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rifa, and Togarma, and the sons of Yavan, Elisha, and Tarshish, and Kitim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the other nations divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. And the sons of, Cush, uh, of Ham, Cush, and Mitzrayim, and Phut, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, Chavila, Savta, Rama, Kavteka, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Didan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a warrior, or a giant, and a hunter in the earth. He was a warrior, this word is merely giant, and a hunter before Yahuwah. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the warrior hunter before Yahuwah. And the beginnings of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Ashur, and built Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth, and Kelach. And Resen, between Nineveh and Kelach, the same as a great city. And Mitzrayim begat Ludim, and Anamim, and Lechavim, and Naphtuchim. And Pathrusim, and Kalsuhim, out of came, out of whom came the Palestim, and Kafturim, and Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Cheth, and the Yebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Arkite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zemurai, and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanim spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you come to Gerar, unto Gaza, as you go unto Sodom and Amorah and Adma, and Seboim, even Laisha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. <clears throat> and Hashem also, the father of all the children of Eber, their brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. And the children of Shem, Elam, and Ashur, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram, and the children of Aram, Uts, and Chul, and Gether, and Mash, and Arphaxad begat Shelach, and Shelach begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Yoktan. And Yoktan begat Almodan, and Shelef, and Chatzar Maveth, and Yerach. And Haloram, and Uzal, and Tikla, and Oval, and Avi Mael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Chavila, and Yobab. All these were the sons of Yoktan. And their dwelling was from Misha, as you come unto Sephar, a mountain of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So uh, not a whole lot I want to talk about here, but I do want to read a little bit of Jasher and the writings of Abraham. Jasher 7, 23-30. And it says, And Cush, the son of Ham, the son of Noah, took a wife in those days in his old age, and she bare a son, and they called his name Nimrod, saying, At that time the sons of man began to rebel and transgress against Elohim. And the child grew up, and his father loved him exceedingly, for he was the son of his old age. This also lets you know that some time passed between um, Noah teaching his sons and then rebellion. This was several generations later. And the garments of skin which Elohim made for Adam and his wife when they went out of the garden were given to Cush. For after the death of Adam and his wife, the garments were given to Enoch, the son of Jared. When Enoch was taken up to Elohim, he gave them to Methuselah, his son. And at the death of Methuselah, Noah took them and brought them into the ark. And they were with him until he went out of the ark. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah, his father. He took them and hid them from his brothers. And when Ham begat his firstborn Cush, he gave him the garments in secret, and they were with Cush many days. And Cush also concealed them from his sons and brothers. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, he gave him those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up, and when he was twenty years old, he put on those garments. And Nimrod became, became strong when he put on those garments. And Elohim gave him might and strength, and he was a mighty hunter in the earth. Yea, he was a mighty hunter in the field, and he hunted the animals, and he built altars, and offered upon them the 
animals before Yahuwah. So there was, seems like there was a time where Nimrod was uh, decent. Uh, but then, of course, he uh, turned. Let's go to the writings of Abraham, 18. It says, Before the death of Ham, the sacred garments were given secretly by him to his son Cush. Remember, Ham stole them when he saw Noah naked. Cush also kept them hidden in his old age and gave them unto his son Nimrod. And when Nimrod was 20 years of age, he put on the garments and he derived great strength and power from them. Moreover, Nimrod was instructed in all the secrets of the evil combination by his father Cain, for Cain had not perished in the flood. Wherefore, Nimrod became a mighty man among the sons of men and established his kingdom and grew stronger and stronger in wickedness after the order of the secret combination, which was from the beginning. For Nimrod spread his dominion over all mankind, save those in the city of Shalom, Salem. So with that, uh, we're going to go to chapter 11, and that'll be our last chapter for today. Hopefully, this part works. Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto the heavens. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And Yahweh said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahuwah scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because Yahuwah did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did Yahuwah scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begot Arphaxad five hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begot Shelach. And Arphaxad lived after he begot Shelach four hundred and three years and begat sons and daughters. And Shelach lived thirty years and begat Eber. And Shelach lived after he begot Eber 403 years, and begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived four and thirty years, and begot Peleg. And Eber lived after he begot Peleg 430 years, and begot sons and daughters. And Peleg lived thirty years, and begat Riu. And Peleg lived after he begot Riu 209 years, and begot sons and daughters. And Riu lived two and thirty years, and begot Serug, and Reu lived after he begot Serug two hundred and seven years, and begot sons and daughters. And Serug lived thirty years, and begot Nahor, and Serug lived after he begot Nahor two hundred years, and begot sons and daughters. And Nahor lived nine and twenty years, and begot Terach, and Nahor lived after he begot Terach a hundred and nineteen years, and begot sons and daughters. And Terach lived seventy years, and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terach. Terach begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terach in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Kazdim. And Abram and Nahor took them women. The name of Abram's woman was Sarai and the name of Nahor's woman, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Yizkah. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terach took Abram his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's woman. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Kazdim to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran, and dwelt there. And the days of Terach were two hundred and five years, 
and Terach died in Haran. Okay, so that's the end of the Torah portion reading. Uh, just I, I got a couple of things I want to mention. Um, we know that in the Torah, we'll read later, of course, when we get to Leviticus, that it is unlawful for a man to marry his sister. And uh, we know that in later in Genesis, when uh, Abraham's trying to protect Sarah, he's like, he calls her his sister. Uh, but when you look at the lineage, he's not, she's not really his sister in the sense of uh, born from the same parents. Um, let's go to Jasher 9. Jasher clears this up because the question would be, well, if Yah had the whole world to pick from and he wanted to start his, uh, you know, he, he wanted to choose one individual from the seed line, don't you think he'd pick someone that maybe didn't marry his sister? And this clears it up. I want, I want to clear uh, Abraham's uh, name here because I don't think he was a sinner because it said that Abraham did not sin. There was no record of Abraham sinning. Or ever being reproved. And Haran, the son of Terah, Abram's oldest brother, took a wife in those days. Haran was 39 years old when he took her. And the wife of Haran conceived and bare a son and called his name Lot. We know Lot was uh, 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 Abraham's nephew. I thought it was I thought it was common knowledge that Lot and, and uh, Sarah were sisters. But or Lot and, and, and Sarah were brother and sister. But And she conceived again and bare a daughter and she called her name Milcah. And she again conceived and bare a daughter and called her name Sarai. Haran was 42 years old when he begot Sarai, which was in the 10th year of the life of Abram. In those days, Abram and his mother and nurse went out from the cave as the king and his subjects had forgotten the affair of Abram. Anyways, uh, I didn't mean to read that that long, but um, it, it may seem extremely weird in our culture uh, to for Abram to marry his niece, but that's what she was, his niece, not his sister. Niece, nephews are not unlawful. Cousins are not unlawful uh, per a scriptural marriage. Now, I know in our day, that's like totally out of, completely out of line. That's called incest and interbreeding. The scriptures doesn't. So we have to come to a point where we either trust what the world has taught us is good and bad or what scriptures tell us is good and bad. Now, he does say brother and sister, total no-go. So that was my thing was like, is Sarah really his sister? Now, uh, when we look, I want to look at, I want to share something. We have a, a passage in the Song of Solomon called, or actually, let's just, uh, hang on. <clears throat> Let me just get up a, a verse here. Let's go to the song. Oops. So it says, uh, a garden in, enclosed is my sister, my spouse. Right, so here we have another reference, a sister and spouse. So this is unlawful. Um, you know, why would the scriptures teach us this? Well, when we look at the interlinear, uh, you know, it's the, I'll show you. Uh, achoti, this means sister. This is the same like uh, if, if I had, like here at the feast of Passover and uh, I see a, a sister, I'd be like, hey sister, hey achoti, uh, my sister. All right, so Abraham wasn't lying. He was like, she's my sister. Well, like my wife, I mean, she's still in the greater sense of the family of Yah. She's my sister. But is she literally my sister? No, she's not physically my sister, but spiritually she's my sister, right? And so in a certain way, Abraham, so people say Abraham was lying. He wasn't, uh uh, she was his sister, but not in the physical sense, if that makes sense. Um, And with that, I want to give you guys homework now. Uh, some of you, <laughs> people got mad in the past. Oh, I, well, who are you, Adam? You think you're some professor to give out homework? Obviously, it's not required. But um, if you want to learn a little more of the details from now until we get to Abraham, uh, again, I'll have uh, all this written down in the uh, the notes. But just in case you don't go to the study notes, uh, I would challenge you to read Jasher 7, verse 43, to the end of chapter 9. Skip 10 because it's irrelevant to the to the discussion. And then 11, chapter 11, 1 through 42. This gives us the backstory of everything that happened in Abraham's life before we meet him. Because we don't meet him until he's well and uh, well. Uh, I don't know exactly how old he is at that point. 60, 50, 60, 70. Uh, we, of course, we, we learn about his age being 75 when... Uh, given the promise of, uh, you know, children and the, the covenant and... But we don't meet Abraham till he's well, uh, at least let's say, let's say he's past 50 uh, at that age. Um, 
But we in Jasher 743 to the end of chapter nine and then 11 for uh, chapter 11 verse one to the end of 11, we get like the early years of Abraham that we don't get in the in the canon. Obviously, some things happened to him. He, you know, he, he probably wasn't some some normal Joe. He 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 did some amazing things. And um, I'll give you just a quick, quick uh, synopsis. Uh, Noah was in the, uh, you know, in the land where Nimrod was and uh uh, Abraham re- refused to bow down to statues uh, and was actually taken up before Nimrod was thrown into the fire just like um, 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 Hananiah, Mishael and, and Azariah were in, in Babylon when they were thrown into the fire so was Abraham he walked around it for three days it's an amazing story um, the um, the book of Jasher uh, uh, is confirmed with the uh, the um, Aramaic Targums and the writings of Abraham all uh, write down the same story. So we have three witnesses for this story. But if you want to learn some stuff about Abraham that you've never learned, please read Jasher 7, verse 43 to the end of chapter 9, and then chapter 11, verse 1 through the, through 42. And I, I know it will bless you, and it will give you a little backstory before we get into Abraham next week in the next week's Torah portion. So real quick, uh, l- last-minute announcement. Um, right now, uh, this is of course prep day Friday. Um, uh, you know, getting into Shabbat. Um, we're camping out for Passover starting Monday and we'll be camping out for a week. So if you don't have any plans and you're like, Hey, you know what? I can drive to Southwest Missouri and go celebrate the feast of Passover and the whole week of unleavened bread and first fruits with the brethren. Come on down. Uh, I'll leave the, the, the link for in the description box. And if you just go to parable, the uh, the front page there has a link to the signups for Passover. So we, uh, our fellow, our local congregation would love to uh, uh, serve you and host this and uh, would love to celebrate with you. So with that, um, let's pray and we'll finish this Torah portion and we'll finish it with a song or two. Father Yahuwah, we just come before you and we bless you and we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your Torah, which we know is nourishment to us. We, Father, we want to be these trees planted by the rivers of water. Help us to stay diligent in studying your Torah and understanding it, Father, and to understand it with the right heart because we know people have studied your Torah meticulously and have used it for evil, Father. So help us with the correct discernment, understanding that we are to look at the Torah through the lens of Messiah. And, Father, just help us uh, to apply what we can apply to our lives today. We, we, we love you and we bless you in Yahushua's name. And, Father, please bless our Pesach and our gatherings, Father. And, uh, of course, even bless those that have already done it. And uh, we just thank you for give us, giving us a heart that wants to celebrate you and your son through these feast days. Uh, we do come before you in Yahushua's name. Amen. Hallelujah. Yahuwah. So let's do a couple songs. Um, I know it's not Sukkot, it's Passover, but this song just always reminds me of these gatherings, which is the best times of my life. So uh, Shalom, I'll see you after Passover a week from today uh, during the Unleavened Bread. All right. Shabbat Shalom. We gather round in Lebanon The constant sound
Stop.